Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series of lessons, which is now drawing to a conclusion, is on the Gospel of Mark. And we're working our way right through the book of Mark, looking at all the ins and outs and so forth. This particular lesson, number 10, for September 7 of 2024, is entitled, The Last Days. This would be the last days in which he's in the temple and doing various things before we, we come to the, uh, you know, the Last Supper and so forth. So we'd like to begin with the word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we consider these amazing events and the stories as it teaches us about you and about your kindness and your gentleness and your love, it's almost too much to take in. Help us to see now um, in these lessons, your hand writ large in our hearts is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. amen. We begin this lesson with the story of the widow who dropped two small copper coins into the offering boxes at the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus was sitting quietly in the temple court section for women. Did you know there was a temple court section for women? Mm -hmm. Why would there be a temple court section for women? The offering receptacles were large and located in the women's area in which were, so women were allowed, as well as men, to, to, to make contributions because the religious leaders wanted everyone to be able to give money. Seeing the widow's gift, Jesus made a striking comment about that woman's action. Jim? Mark chapter 12, verses 41 to 44. As Jesus sat near the temple treasury, he watched the people as they dropped in their money Many rich men dropped in a lot of money. Then a poor widow came along and dropped in two little, co little copper coins worth about a penny. He called his disciples together and said to them, I tell you that that poor widow put more in the offering box than all the others. For others put in what they had to spare of their riches. But she, poor as she was, put in all she had. She gave it all, excuse me, she gave all she had to give on. To live on. To live on the American Bible Society in 1992. At the time of the Passover, many of the wealthy of Jerusalem were giving enormous offerings and making a great display of doing so. This widow quietly approached one of the offering locations, and when she thought no one was watching, she didn't realize that the Son of God was watching, <laughs> she cast in two tiny lepta, I actually have a lepta at home. It's, so, <laughs> it's about so small. Anyway, uh, two lepta would be uh, the amount that would be paid for a normal worker working about 15 minutes. That's how much it was worth. So why did Jesus make a big thing out of that woman's offering? And why did Jesus say that this woman gave more than anyone else? Most of those who were giving in generous offerings did so out of their abundance. However, this woman tossed in all that she had. We, of course, do not know anything about the story that led up to this event. We would know nothing at all about her situation if it had not been for the words of Jesus recorded in the Bible. But one very important lesson we need to learn from this story is that it is almost certain that the Sadducees, who would have collected those offerings, would probably have sneered at this woman's offering of two lepta. Toss it over their shoulder, maybe. They did not care about those tiny little amounts. What do you think men like Caiaphas and Annas would do with two lepta? It is often thought that when we look at the way certain leaders are using church funds and we are not happy about what they are doing with the church's money, that's a good excuse for withholding our offerings. Surely if there was anyone who would have had reason for withholding his or her offerings under such circumstances, it would have been this widow. But Jesus said very clearly that the issue is that she gave her all to God, not asking any questions about how it would be used. Now, we are not disputing the fact that leaders have a very serious responsibility for managing money, which is given to the church. However, even if they are squandering that money, it does not relieve us <clears throat> of the responsibility of paying our tithes and offerings, which we are giving to God and not to church leaders, who may be mismanaging them. Hmm. 
Let's move now to Mark 13. Jesus talked about hardships to follow at the destruction of Jerusalem during Christian persecution throughout the ages and specifically before his second coming. Now you will remember, I'm sure, that Mark 13 and Luke 21 and Matthew 24 are the chapters where Jesus talks about the predictions for the future and focusing particularly on what two occasions? The destruction of Jerusalem and the second coming. This destruction of Jerusalem and the second coming. One is behind us and one of the, another one's in front of us. Well, Jesus had spent the whole day in the temple courts, contending with the Pharisees and Sadducees, and finally a single scribe. Notice what happened at the end of that day. Mark 13, 1 through 4. And Jesus was living, as Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples says, Look, teacher, what a wonderful stones and buildings. Jesus answered, You see these great buildings? Not a single stone here will be left in this place. Every one of them will be thrown down. Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives across from the temple when Peter, James, John, and Andrew came close to him in private. Tell us when this will be. They said, and tell us what will happen to show that the time has come for all of these things to take place. Yeah, wouldn't you like to have a warning? <laughs> if you know the world is coming to an end. Herod had been raised in Rome as a friend of the Caesars. When Caesar asked Herod to go to Palestine and rule there, he recognized that Herod was not strictly a Jew, but he was, because he was happy to me in a descendant of Esau. With Caesar's approval and to gain favor with the Jews, Herod began expanding the temple in Jerusalem around 20 BC. Herod managed to increase the area known as the Temple Mount to be a considerably larger area than it was originally, probably twice as large as the Temple Mount was originally. So the temple in Jerusalem was an amazing structure, made largely of beautiful white marble and decorated with gold. It shone beautifully in the sunlight. The stones of enormous size, some of them weighing hundreds of tons, were carved and put in their places. To get an idea of the size and expense that must have gone into constructing the temple, we notice that the Parthenon in Athens, that enormous temple which dominates most of Athens, had 46 outer columns and 23 inner columns. Uh, by contrast, Herod's temple had 162 pillars of a similar size, but just in one of the porticos on the south side of the temple complex. Mm. Mm. I mean, that's amazing. Josephus reported that each of those pillars was about 20 feet in its circumference and seven or seven feet in diameter. Now, tell me, how did they move those things? And some of them came from miles and miles and miles away. I've told you about my experience. I was in a tour in, in Turkey, and we were driving a little tiny back road that was hardly, almost hardly room for one car on this road. And the guy said, stop, told the driver to stop. We jumped out, we climbed up over a little hill down the other side, and there was a, a mint, well, no, I wouldn't call it a mint, whatever, a, a quarry, where they were making these kind of columns. I mean, this was, miles from nowhere. I mean, How there were, were they moving them. Yes, and there, there were these big round, I mean, huge big round things. And so I'm still sitting there. Yeah. They never got moved. I mean, amazing. Um, it must have seemed to the disciples like the destruction of this temple, which had taken so many years to build, would be like the end of the world. How do you suppose those large stones are moved at considerable distance by hand and put in position in the temple? And you know, if you have a chance to visit Jerusalem, you need to take the little tour that goes around along the western wall of that temple. This is not the temple itself. This is just the, 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 the border around the outside. There's one, one single stone that's 160, to 160 tons or 1,600 tons. I can't remember, but it's enormous. And there, you know, they, those things got put there and they're just, you can't even put a piece of paper in between. 
Uh, yeah. mm. Okay. From the writings of Ellen G. White, as Christ's attention was attracted to the magnificence of the temple, what must have been the unuttered thoughts of that rejected one? The view before him was indeed beautiful, but he said with sadness, I see it all. The buildings are indeed wonderful. You point to these walls as apparently indestructible, but listen to my words. The day will come when there shall be left one stone upon another, or not, there shall not be left yeah. one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Wow. Outrageous. The four disciples who were with Jesus, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, must have immediately wondered what Jesus was talking about. You know, if we saw one of our friends said something, like, we'd say, what have you been smoking? Or what? Yeah. <laughs> something like that. Yes. They must have wondered and it, how, when such a thing could happen. And Mark 13, 5 to 11, 13, Jesus spent most of his time talking not about when these events would take place, but rather what they should do to prepare for that time. He gave specific warnings of events that would occur before the destruction and directions about what they were to do when they saw that Jerusalem was surrounded by the enemy. Notice what the Christians did and what the results were. Gordon. From, from Great Controversy, not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. Christ had given his disciples warning and all who believed his words watched for the promised sign and they fled. Yeah. They fled to a place on the other side of the Jordan River up near the, the southern end of the Sea of Galilee called Pella. Historically, we know that the Roman general Titus is the one who finally conquered Jerusalem in AD 70. And by the way, and one of the tours I was on, they took us to an uh, aqueduct where they were bringing water into the, one of the cities, the small towns down there by the coast. And there was a, a, a little thing done by, well, probably not by Titus himself, but Titus and his son, you know, there's their names right there carved into the wall. Mm -hmm. Amazing. The rejection of Jesus as the message, Messiah by the Jewish people led ultimately to that destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman army. From the Bible study guide, the fulfillment of prophecy hundreds of years after the time of the prophet Daniel. That's yeah. So what we're talking about, of, go ahead. Okay. Mrs. White says, the Jews had rejected the entreaties of the Son of God and now expo expostulation. Expost okay. An entreaty only made them more determined to resist to the last. In vain were the efforts of Titus to save the temple. One greater than he had declared that not one stone would be left upon another. Mm. Great yeah. Controversy, page 32. Flavius Josephus, a Jewish historian, described the destruction of Jerusalem. In these words, Titus retired into the Tower of Antonia. Now, if you've looked at the, the ancient depictions of, of the temple and the temple of, and, the, and the Tower of Antonia, the Romans built a big tower right next to the temple complex so they could get up on the higher levels and look right over to see what was going on in the temple grounds. And that was specifically to, be, to, to, to prevent the possibility of any kind of rebellion starting in the, in the temple courtyard. And so he thought, okay, he'll be safe up here. He'll just, just keep an eye on things. Um, and resolve, the, resolve the, to storm the temple the next day, he and his people. Early in the morning, with his whole army, and to encamp around the holy house, which is his term for the temple. But as for that house, God had for, for certain long ago doomed it to, to fire. And that's why that previous statement from this Bible study guide is in there. And now that fatal day was come. According to the revolution of ages, <clears throat> it was the 10th day of the month of Luz, or Ab. Uh, Jew, the Jews had interesting names for their months, upon which was formerly burned by the king of Babylon, although these flames took their rise from the Jews themselves and were occasion to them for upon uh, Titus's retiring, the rebellious lay still for a little while and then attacked the Romans again. 
So uh, he, he's sort of jumbling things up here a little bit, but he said, um, Babylon had previously destroyed Solomon's temple, and now the thing is same ha 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 happening again. <coughs> Excuse me. When those that guarded the holy house fought with those who quenched the fire that was burning in the inner court of the temple, but these Romans put the Jews to flight and proceeded as far as the holy house itself. So there were Jews inside there trying to protect the, the temple, and there were Romans there, and so it was a there was a battle going on in the, in the temple grounds. Now around the altar lay dead bodies heaped one upon the other, as at the steps going up to it ran a great quantity of their blood, where also the dead bodies that were killed above on the altar fell down. That's complete works of Josephus. And you can see the references there from our Bible study guide. So compare these words from Ellen White. Jim? After the destruction of the temple, the whole city soon fell into the hands of the Romans. The leaders of the Jews forsook their impregnable towers, and Titus oh, excuse me, found them solitary, and gazed, excuse me, he gazed upon them with amazement and declared that God had given them into his hands, for no engines, however powerful, could have prevailed against those stupendous battlements. Both the city and the temple were raised to their foundations, and the ground upon which the holy house had stood was plowed like a field. Jeremiah 26, 18. In the siege and the slaughter that followed, more than a million of the people perished. The survivors were carried away as captives, sold as slaves, dragged to Rome to, disgrace, to grace the conqueror's triumph, thrown, into, excuse me, thrown to wild beasts in the amphitheaters, or scattered as homeless wanderers throughout the earth. Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 352. Wow, wow, wow. Well, Mark 13, 14 through 18. Back to, uh, I'm so, sorry. You had uh, Jeremiah, that quotation from Jeremiah, is, is that a, a, a restatement about the uh, That's just the word that they, they picked out, yeah, the plowed, plowed like uh, a field. But is it, uh, that's from the first, uh, from the captivity? Is what, where that, uh, Jeremiah 26, that's not from Jesus, from uh, uh, A.D. 70. No, yeah. no, no, this is, yeah. It was a prediction. It's a yeah. prophecy. Yeah. Well, Jesus also gave the same prophecy in, in uh, mm -hmm. the gospel there. Well, look at this. You will see the awful whore standing in the place where he should not be. Note to the reader, be sure to understand what this means. Then those who are in Judea must run away to the hills. Someone who's on the roof of his house must not lose time to go by going down into the house to get anything to take with him. Someone who's in the field must not go back to the house for his cloak. How terrible it will be for those days for women who are pregnant and for mothers with little babies. Pray to God that these things will not happen in the winter. Okay, and these are words that we, we usually quote from Matthew, which is slightly different. Jesus mentions the term abomination of desolation or the awful horror. What does that refer to? Then Jesus, seeing this scene probably envisioned in his mind, remarked about how important it would be for Christians to hasten away from Jerusalem as soon as they saw these key events taking place. It would be a special problem for mothers with young babies and pregnant women, and he asked them to pray that it would not happen in winter or on the Sabbath. Then Jesus mentioned a very important point that he emphasized, and he emphasized it, I'm sorry, Note to the reader, be sure to understand what this means. That should grab our attention to see if we understand it. It turns out the expression came from places in Daniel, such as Daniel 9.27, 11.31, 12.11, and even a parallel suggestion in Daniel 8.31. And now you all are going to tell me how many years before Christ was Daniel? Close to uh, 600, 600 years. Okay. 500 yeah. something. <laughs> well, 600 down to about 500, yeah. Right. He lived for almost 100 years. <clears throat> so the destruction of Jerusalem had been prophesied by Daniel. And then we have these words, Charles. I just wanted to make a comment. Yeah. These words, um, one Jewish theologian said, 
let the bones of the fingers dry up, the ones who want to understand these words of yeah. Daniel chapter 9. And the, the other thing is that the Jesuits also came up, preteristic and futuristic teachings, mm -hmm. totally getting the people out of who the Antichrist is. Yeah. Well, and you're mentioning something that uh, we would talk about if we were talking about the book of Daniel, and that's that yeah. Genesis and Daniel have been the two books that have been at attacked most by critics because, and you're talking about the Jews with the may your finger dry up. Obviously, if they understand this verse, that these verses are just about to read, they would have known that it points to the, to the days of Jesus very specifically, exactly. And that's, that's, that's a, anathema. Yes, and the, the church also mm, has come yeah. up with such trickery. Now the Christians don't talk about Antichrist yeah, anymore. Yeah, they yeah. talk about preteristic and futuristic uh, thoughts. Clever, very clever. Daniel 9, 26, 27. The angel Gabriel said, and at the end of that time, God's chosen leader, leader will be killed unjustly. The city and the temple will be destroyed by the invading army of a powerful ruler. The end will come like a flood bringing the war and destruction which God has prepared. That ruler will have a firm agreement with many people for seven years. And when the half time is passed, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. The awful horror will be placed on the highest point of the temple and will remain there until the one who put the, there meets the end which God has prepared for him. Good news, Bible. Daniel chapter 11, verse 31. Some of his soldiers, some, some of his soldiers will desecrate the temple. They We've will already read about that, haven't we? Josephus' words, yeah. Yes, and uh, they will stop the daily sacrifices and set up awful horror. Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. From the time the daily sacrifices are stopped, that is, from the time of the awful horror, is 1,290 days will pass. Okay, so in Daniel 9, 26, the Hebrew word Mashiach, in English, Messiah, or God's chosen leader, refers to the coming of Jesus Christ. The 490-year or 70-week prophecy given in Daniel 9, 24 through 27 can be attached to the prophecy to restore and rebuild Jerusalem given to Ezra by Artaxerxes is noted in Ezra 7:18 dated to the year 457 B.C. That takes us down, the 490 years take us down to A.D. 34. So, many so-called scholars try to connect the awful horror or, or abomination of a desolation to the activities of Antiochus Epiphanes, which took place in the second century B.C. But if we carefully read the words of Jesus, he said that that event would be still in the future. That makes Antiochus Epiphanes impossible as a fulfillment of that prophecy. And that's a really important point if you ever run across people who come up with that idea. Ellen White suggested that the destruction of Jerusalem was a foretaste of what will happen prior to the second coming of Jesus. And the, the reason why they have, have a problem with that is because they don't believe in, that God can foretell the yeah. future. Yeah. Because if he could, then they think, well, God, then God can control it. Yeah. And, and so they, we will lose our freedom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jennifer? Um, from Ellen G. White, Christ saw in Jerusalem a symbol of the world hardened in unbelief and rebellion and hastening on to meet the retributive judgments of God. Okay, so Jesus talked about his second coming and what to be aware of in those days. So now let's look at the second half of his comments. Mark 13, verses 19 to 23. For the trouble of those days will be far worse than any the world has ever known from the very beginning when God created the world until the present time. So, you know, those who don't believe in the Old Testament, you know, well, we'll throw out creation. Well, here Jesus is talking about God created the world. Yes, not only that, um, if you watch, if you listen to the news, you're hearing the worst storms ever recorded, the highest temperatures ever recorded, the biggest rainfalls ever recorded. Something's happening. 
they never and they never quote uh, Genesis eight what twenty three, <laughs> hot and cold, summer and day and night, springtime and harvest shall not cease as long as the earth shall last. Yeah, <laughs> we, we will need to. We don't have the time, but uh, COP twenty eight. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Laude to see. These are all about who is going to control uh, mm. the world, and that day is coming so soon. The other thing, I just very quickly, unbelief and rebellion. The worst than that is giving false information. False information. Yeah. That's what's happening. Go Continuing ahead. at the end of verse 19, nor will there ever be anything like it again. But the Lord has reduced the number of those days. If he had not, nobody would survive. For the sake of his chosen people, however, he has reduced those days. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe him. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear. They will perform miracles and wonders in order to deceive even God's chosen people, if possible. Be on your guard. I have told you everything before the time comes. From the okay. Good News Bible. So who's going to be doing miracles? The devil. Yes. Yeah. So don't, okay. don't believe miracles. So Jesus spoke also additional words about the last days. Myra? Mark 13, 24 to 31. In the days after the time of trouble, the sun will grow dark and the moon will no longer shine. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers in the space in space will be driven from their courses. Now the Son of Man will appear coming in the clouds with great power and glory. He will send the angels out to the four corners of the earth. So we have corners? Well, that's something <laughs> figurative. <laughs> Yeah, I, I every time I read that, North, I think about south and west. That, there we go. Um, the four corners of the earth to gather God's chosen people from one end of the world to the other. We rem remember that all these things will happen before the people now living have all died. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Good news, Bible. So a lot of skeptics look at that and you see, obviously. He didn't know what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. But all those people living in Jesus' day have died. How can we reconcile what Jesus said? Now we're going to do a little bit of careful, uh, well, looking at the Greek and what it says. From our Bible study guide, for what, however, does Jesus mean by this generation and that day or that hour? These words have troubled many people because obviously the generation to whom Jesus spoke is long dead. A number of solutions to this problem have been suggested. Some argue that the word generation can refer to a race of people, in this case, the Jews. That is to say that the Jewish race would not perish before Christ returns. Another solution is to speak of a generation of people who see all the signs fulfilled as those that will not pass away before Christ returns. But a simpler solution is to note that in Mark 13, 30, Jesus uses the word this as in this generation, and in Mark 13, 32, he uses the word that as in that day and hour. Mark 13, 13, the word is, and the words are hautos, haute, and tota, appears most often in verses 1 through 13, leading to the destruction of Jerusalem. The word that characterizes the latter part of the chapter. Thus, this generation most likely refers to the first century generation, which saw the destruction of Jerusalem, as Mark 13.30 describes. However, Mark 13.32 refers to the second coming of Christ, which is still future and was more distant from the, uh, from the first century. Consequently, Mark 13.32 uses the word that to speak of events more distant from, this, from the first century from our Bible study guide. That's a long thing, but I mean, we know those words. I mean, we talk about this thing, which is close to us here, and we talk about that thing, which is far away. And they, the Greeks did the same thing. So what does God tell us to do as we are awaiting that momentous occasion? We are to be constantly awake, alert, and watching. Jim? Mark 12, 32. 13. Excuse me, I'm 13. <laughs> Okay. Uh, no one knows, however, when that day will 
or hour will come. Neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, only the Father knows. Good news, Bible. So what event was being prophesied to those words? Surely it must refer to the second coming of Jesus Christ. They were to expect earthquakes, persecution, and trials, even the killing of many. But the second coming would not be then. They were to know that even close family members might turn against them during those difficult times but God's spirit would always be present. Have you had any serious experiences that might qualify? The New Testament is full of prophecies pointing to the second coming. See, for example, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Our brothers and sisters, we want you to know the truth about those who have died so that you will not be sad, as are those who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will take back with Jesus those who have died believing in him. What we are teaching you now is that Lord's teaching. We who are alive on the day that Lord comes will not go ahead of those who have died. There will be the shout of command, the archangel's voice, sound of God's trumpet, and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died believing in Christ will rise to life first. Then we who are living at that time will be gathered up along with those who are in the cloud um, to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So then encourage one another with these words. And there are several places in the New Testament. This is just one of them that suggests that we're all going to, all the righteous people are going to be gathered together and meet the Lord at the same time. That, that leads, completely eliminates the idea that some people are going to go straight to heaven when they die or there's going to be some kind of uh, time just before the end when the righteous people are going to be swept away and no. <laughs> They use same author's writing, I mean, if, if indeed, uh, yeah, Thessalonians was written by Paul. Paul. He'll say, Bill Bunnell, trust me, Charles, being absent from the Lord, body present with the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Of course, the book of Revelation has many things to say about the second coming of Jesus. For example, see Revelation 1, 7, which talks about, well, let's look at some of these verses. Revelation 1, 7, 6, 12 to 17, and Revelation 14, 14 to 20. Gordon? No, oh, no, Jennifer, I'm sorry. Revelation 1, 7. Look, he is coming on the clouds. Everyone will see him, including those who pierced him. All peoples on earth will mourn over him. So shall it be. And then Revelation 6, 12 through 17. And I saw the lamb break open the sixth seal. There was a violent earthquake, and the sun became black like coarse black cloth, and the moon turned completely red like blood. The stars fell down to the earth like unripe figs falling from the tree when a strong wind shakes it. The sky disappeared like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was moved from its place. That's going to be a pretty serious earthquake, right? Then the kings of the earth, the rulers and the military chiefs, the rich and the powerful, and all other people, slave and free, hid themselves in caves and under rocks on the mountains. They called out to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the eyes of the one who sits on the throne and from the anger of the lamb. The terrible day of their anger is here and who can stand against it? From the Good News Bible. Wow. And we know that God's anger is described as <clears throat> his letting people go when they don't want him anyway leaving them to their own, their own destruction. Okay. Re Revelation 14, 14 to 20. Then I looked and there was a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was what looked like a human being with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and cried out in a loud voice to the one who was sitting on the cloud, use your sickle and reap the harvest because the time has come the earth is ripe for the harvest. Then the one who sat on the cloud swung his sickle on the earth 
and the earth's harvest was reaped. Then I saw another angel come out of the temple in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel who was in charge of the fire came from the altar. He shouted in a loud voice to the angel who had the sharp sickle, use your sickle and cut the grapes from the vineyard of the earth because the grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle on the earth and cut the grapes from the vine and threw them into the winepress of God's furious anger. So this, this is talking about the time when virtually everyone on earth, look at, if you look back at Revelation 13, you'll see it there, uh, has turned against God. Almost everyone. Almost everyone, yeah. Verse 20, the grapes were squeezed out in the winepress outside the city and blood came out of the winepress in flood in a flood 300 kilometers long and nearly two meters deep. Good news, yeah, Bible. It's hard to imagine how that's possible. Well, there's crazy things coming, I'm sure. Contrast these verses with Revelation 19, 11 through 21, in which the Bible tells us how God will finally bring the great controversy to an end. In Revelation 19, 11 to 21, then I saw heaven open and there was a white horse. Its rider was called Faithful and True. It is without justice that he judges. No, with justice. With, yes. With justice, justice that he judges and fights his battles. His eyes were like a flame of fire. He wore many crowns on his head. He had the name written on him, had a name written on him, but no one except himself knows what it is. The robe he wore was covered with blood. His name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven followed him, riding on white horses, dressed in clean white linen. Out of his mouth came a sharp sword with which he will defeat the nations. Let me interrupt for a moment, okay? What does it mean when we talk about a sharp sword coming out of someone's mouth? So what comes word, out? Symbolic of the words. The words. Yeah. yeah. So Satan tells lies. So when God comes along and tells the truth, that's like a sword. It gives you, it's, your, it's for you to be able to judge. Yeah. In fact, I think it's in John 8 or 6, 20, 39 or something like that. He says, I came for judgment, mm -hmm. not to judge you, but so did you have something to ju judge what's been going around you, on around you? Okay, go ahead. Out of his mouth came this sharp sword. Mm -hmm. um, he will rule over them with a rod of iron. He will trample out the wine in the wine press of the furious anger, furious anger of the Almighty God. On his robe and on his sire written his name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yes. Then the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered to fight one another. Who, who was to fight, fight against, against one who was riding the horse against his army. The beast was taken prisoner together with the false prophet who had performed miracles in his presence. It was those miracles that he deceived those who had the mark of the beast and those who worshiped the image of the beast. The beast and the false prophet were both thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And what do we call that? <clears throat> That's the second death. Yes. Their armies were killed by the sword that comes out of the mouth of the one who was riding the horse. So what words does he say that's going to kill them? Wait and see, I guess. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the birds ate all they could of their flesh. Good news, Bible. So we've read some pretty horrendous things from portions, especially Revelation here. Note that God wants all his children to come to what? Repentance. Repentance. Okay, let's pick something a little better. Second Peter 3, 3 through 13. First of all, you must understand that in these last days, some people will appear whose lives are controlled by their own lusts. They will mock you and will ask, he promised to come, didn't he? Where is he? Our ancestors have already died, but everything is still the same as it was since the creation of the world. They purposely ignore the fact that long ago God gave a command and the heavens and earth were created. The earth was formed out of water 
and by water, and it was also by water, the water of the flood, that the old world was destroyed. So again, Wait, the, the flood, creation in, in the, the New, New Testament. Testament. But the heavens and the earth that now exist are being preserved by the same command of God in order to be destroyed by fire. They are being kept for the day when godless people will be judged and destroyed. But do not forget one thing, my dear friends, there is no difference in the Lord's sight between one day and a thousand years. To him, the two are the same. The Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, as some think. Instead, he is patient with you because he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants all to turn away from their sins. So why is God delaying his coming? To allow us to turn away from our sins. Are we doing that? Hopefully not so most are. of us. Maybe not any of us. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. This is for the people who aren't prepared. On that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise, the heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed, and the earth with everything in it will vanish. What kind of power, what kind of burning does that require? Nuclear. That's nuclear destruction. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you can wait, as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. But we wait for what God has promised, new heavens and a new earth where righteousness will be at home. And that's the secret. Yeah. Near the end of his life on this earth, do you think Jesus actually saw a vision of things that had not yet happened on this earth? You bet. Absolutely. Did he see our days? Why not? I think so. I have suggested before in this class that uh, I believe every night, there's in the Bible it says this in several locations, that every night Jesus would meet with his Father, God, and plan for the next day. So God, have, I'm sure, informed him his humanity, if it was, or he exercised his own divinity, I don't know. But he was prepared when these kind of things happened. Do you think that some of the signs that Jesus mentioned in Mark 13, Luke 21, and Matthew 24 are taking place around us in the world today? Don't everybody speak up all at once. Absolutely. What should that teach us? Going home. Think of all God's faithful people who have died. The next thing they will see is Jesus yes. coming in the clouds of heaven. And I've talked about that on a few occasions. Uh, Ellen White makes it very clear that Satan, uh, God will not allow Satan to duplicate the manner of Christ coming. So what's the manner of Christ coming? The entire sky from one end to the other is going to be full of bright shining angels. So if you want to know if it's the real Jesus, all you have to do is look up, just like that. So, of course, what, um, think of all God's faithful people who have died and so forth. What is eschatology? We're, we're talking about often linked together the description of eschatology. What's eschatology? Study, study of last of things. Second. Study of last day events. Um, notice it says this definition from Goodman's Dictionary. That would be yours, Jim, I think. Erdman's Dictionary states that eschatology, from, from the Greek eschatos, meaning last, concerns expectations of an end time, whether the close of history, the world itself, or the present age. John T. Campbell, Eschatology, Erdman Dictionary of the Bible. Okay, eschatology means nothing, less you, nothing unless you believe that God has the power to predict future events far in advance. So if you don't think God has that power, like a lot of people today don't think he does, then eschatology, they have nothing to say about eschatology. There are many long-term and many short-term predictions in the Bible, all of which have been fulfilled except for those predictions directly connected to the second coming of Jesus. Those that, those that take the position that God cannot tell the future, they've locked themselves into a paradigm. Yeah a paradigm of preconceived errors, and that's, you know, the acronym would be a P-O-P-E, mm -hmm. hope, paradigm yeah. <laughs> of preconceived errors. 
Okay. The interesting thing is that this was this is nothing new. Way back in Isaiah's day, Isaiah 40 to 55, it says just chapters right there. It says that tell the difference between the real God and all the fakes. The real God can create out of nothing and he could predict the future far in advance. Well, years before that was with Satan through the serpent. You know you're not going to die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, the 70 week prophecy specifically targeting the period of time allotted for the Jewish nation as a nation was fulfilled exactly as predicted in AD 27, 31, and 34. And if we had a long time, I would take you back and show you all the history, how that entire chronology, including all the chronology of Paul's experience of what everything fits exactly to the exact year. It's amazing that God predicted all that in advance. The baptism of Jesus, his death on the cross and the stoning of Stephen with the gospel rapidly spreading to Gentiles in the Mediterranean world fulfilled the prediction in that final week of the 70 week prophecy. It's important for us to remember the lessons we should have learned from Isaiah 40 through 55, which was what I mentioned a, a, a little bit ago. And it starts out with things like, these people are take, cutting down a tree and they're carving on it and they're taking half of the tree and burning it to uh, cook their food and the other half turning into a god. And he says, let's talk about those. What, what can those gods do for you? It's just crazy. It says, if you worship worthless gods, you become worthless yourself. The two great features that identify the one true God from all pretenders, here they are, God's ability to create out of nothing and his ability to predict events far in advance. No pretend God can do either of those things. Prophecy also forms a very important vision, provision for God's faithful people. It gives some hints about what is coming. Some of God's prophecies were given specific time periods and came, in, came to pass. This is predicted. However, we have not been given, and Jesus told us we would not be given, a specific date for the second coming. This was connected with many one, uh, warnings from Jesus to watch and not be taken by surprise. Summarizing then. Summarizing then, Mark 13, 9 through 37. We're going to pick just a few verses You here. yourselves must be on guard. You will be arrested and taken to court. You will be beaten in the synagogues. You will stand before the rulers and kings for my name's sake to tell them the good news. Be on your guard. I've told you everything before the time comes. Let the fig tree teach you a lesson. When its branches become green and tender and starts putting out leaves, you know that summer is near. Be on watch, be alert, for you do not know when the time will come. But on guard, then, because you do not know when the master of the house is coming. It might be in the evening or in midnight or before dawn or at sunrise. What I say to you then, I say to all, watch. I use an illustration very sometimes. Um, people say, well, where are the signs and so forth? I said, okay, if, you, if someone says, uh, you have a good friend that lives a ways away, and they say, come and visit me, and say, okay, I'll be all right over. Do you have to look at the street signs to know where to go? No, you know, this road and that road and that road. And you, and now Jesus has given us these kinds of signs. He doesn't say you have to g give exact dates. He says, no, look at the signs. So Jesus warned the disciples of both the destruction of Jerusalem and his second coming. Jennifer? From Ellen G. White, as he warned his disciples of Jerusalem's destruction, giving them a sign of the approaching ruin, that they might make their escape. So he has warned the world of the day of final destruction and has given them tokens of its approach that all who will may flee from the wrath to come. After talking about the destruction of the temple, Jesus said that many will come claiming to be Christ or claiming to be prophets before the great and final day of this earth's history. And I always remember when it, I read that passage, a few years ago, not too long ago, two, three years ago, National Geographic magazine had an entire article about people who claimed to be God. I thought, what? 
<laughs> yeah, there it was. Okay, go ahead. Reading from Mark 13, 5 to 13. Jesus said to them, be on guard and don't let anyone deceive you. Many men claiming to speak for me will come and say, I am here. I'm he. I am he. And they will deceive many people. And don't be troubled when you hear the noise of battles close by and news of battles far away. Such things must happen, but they do not mean that the end has come. Countries will fight each other. Kingdoms will attack one another. There will be earthquakes everywhere and there will be famines. These things are like the first pains of childbirth. You yourselves must be on guard. You will be arrested and taken to court. You will be beaten in the synagogues. What do you think that means in terms of 2024? Well, arrested and taken to court, we can understand that. Beaten in the synagogues, I'm not sure. It could happen, though. It certainly happens in other countries. Yeah, does, does it that happen here? It, does, is it, when it, it, does that include beaten in churches? I hey, maybe I shouldn't mention this, but you know that in the, the massacre that happened in Rwanda a few years ago, people fled to a church yes. because they thought they would be safe there, and the enemy came in and just mowed them down. It was about 800 plus or there. Oh, a lot of them. I've forgotten the exact yeah. number. Yeah. I want Locked to, the doors and set the place on fire. Yeah. Well, another story similar. They, they hid in the church, but there were Tutsis and Hurus. The leader yeah. says, I know there are Hurus in here. We want you to come to this one side. Mm -hmm. In the face of death, they all went to that side. Now, they were not PhD degree holders. They were yeah. simple, simple believers yeah. in God. By the way, they, all of them were killed. All. Mm -hmm. I've been there. That day is coming. It was, it was, it was Rwanda and Burundi were Christian-type princes, weren't they? Mm -hmm. but yes. They, they were so, Seventh-day Adventist pastors. I, I know that. I know that. I'm just talking about the country itself. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you were referring yeah. to that that Sabbath morning uh, system. Yeah. So what brand, what brand of theology, Christianity, so forth, did they really understand? Well, it's it's hard. It's hard to know. A good question. Tribalism okay. is alive in Seventh-day Adventist Church. Yeah, in, yes, in, in the world. In, in the in, world. In, including in, in, in the church. Too. Yes, and it is sad. Okay, Gordon. Continuing in verse 9, you will be arrested and taken to court. You will be beaten in the synagogues. You will stand before rulers and kings for my sake to tell them the good news. But before the end comes, the gospel must be preached to all peoples. And when you are arrested and taken to court, do not worry beforehand about what you're going to say. When the time comes, say whatever is then given to you. Hmm. For the words you speak will not be yours. They will come from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Wow. Men will hand over their own brothers to be put to death. And fathers will do the same to their children. Children will turn against their parents and will have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. Hmm. But whoever holds out to the end will be saved. Good news, Bible. Okay, well, you know, repeatedly Seventh-day Adventists have pointed out the importance of the dark day and the moon turning to blood in 1780. That was a while back. As well as the falling of the stars in 1833 as heaven-ordained events linked to the time of the end. And, of course, they were. Because what, that, what happened as a result of those events, people who, a lot of people studied and understood the Bible in those days, or at least had some idea, they said, these are the things that were prophesied. Was that a big fire in Canada that caused that? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, Mark 13, 24. Myra? In the days after the time of trouble, the sun will grow dark and the moon will no longer shine. Good news, Bible. Remembering what had been written in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 when these events took place, many Bible-believing Christians took notice. And then when the Pope was taken captive, 1798, another prophecy fulfilled, and the power of the Roman Catholic Church was depleted for a time, it seemed clear to them that the second coming was just around the corner. Mark 13, 20 through 23, gives us a promise that God will not allow his faithful people to be completely wiped out. 
He will protect them by shortening the days of persecution. And remember that at the end, Satan is determined absolutely to wipe out all of God's people. And, God's, and God says, you can wipe out your people if you want to, but my people, I'm going to protect them. And that's what's going to bring in the final plagues. Wow. Logically, this seems to fit with the idea that as, Reformation, as the Reformation expanded, Roman authority was dim, diminished. But Jesus went on to say in Mark 13, 21 to 23, that a time was coming when false prophets and false Christs would arise. And then he described the time when that would take place. Mark 13 talks about other events, events even worse than the destruction of Jerusalem. Was Jesus referring to his second coming and also early, earlier events or per, a persecution in the dark ages? Tim? Can you? Mark 13, verse 19. For the trouble of those days will be far worse than any of the world has ever known from the be very beginning when God created the world until the present time, nor will there ever be anything like it again. Good News Bible. Okay. This, Go ahead and read that, Jim. Okay. The Savior's prophecy concerning the visitation of judgments upon Jerusalem is to have another fulfillment of which that terrible desolation was but a faint shadow. In the fate of the chosen city, we may behold the doom of a world that has rejected God's mercy and trampled upon his law. Dark are the records of human his misery that earth ha has witnessed during the long centuries of crime. Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 36. Yes. As we have concluded in Mark 13, 14, discusses the fulfillment of the 70-week prophecy of Daniel 9. Of course, Daniel 9 is linked to the prophecies of Daniel 7 and 8, um, and the little horn power which persecuted the people of God for 1260 days, prophetic days or years. Historically, that this time of persecution can be linked to the dates of 538 to 1798, and we're running out of time. Couldn't God have protected his faithful people back in those days? Yes, he could, but he didn't. Why? Well, he did some, the Walden Seas and so forth. And we may never know this side of the kingdom exactly why Jesus mixed these events up. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for all these warning signs. Think about the history of Jerusalem and what that might imply about what's going to happen in the future. Lord, we thank you for the calm which we are living in right now, even though it seems like things are becoming more and more uh, wild and crazy. May we be prepared when the day comes, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.